Thank you very much, Professor Defrinov. It's a great pleasure for me that you have introduced me, and I'm also very much uh, I am thankful to the James Marder Center for Non-Professional Studies and Mirabai Institute that they are giving me this opportunity to share my point of view on this subject with you. When we use the word delicate balance of terror, of course, it's a term which was coined or used in the literature during the Cold War period, especially after the Russians intercontinental ballistic missile test. And then there was the start of the, the time and they start looking at how we can preserve this balance of terror for the sake of strategic stability or you can say at least prevent the war. The delicate balance of terror was, you can say, institutionalized, I can say, after the 1972 ABM Treaty. Because both sides agreed to keep themselves vulnerable to each other's strikes and at the same time maintaining their survival capability. Now, on the basis of that, we say that the delicate or balance of terror has created some kind of a deterrent stability. In this context, when we are looking in South Asia, whether this delegate of balance of terror is providing us some kind of a optimism that what during the Cold War uh, you have seen that the deterrent stability leading to or entailing the strategic stability had a positive impact. Can we be optimistic about that kind of situation in South Asia? So the jury is very much open, so it's not possible that simply we say that what happened in the Cold War, it is going to happen in South Asia. There are many different issues. We can look these things with the second nuclear age, which Professor used sometimes in his articles, so that second nuclear age and these kind of things. So we have to look about these things in that, in that context. Having said that, let me, while framing my a few questions which I try to answer, a, we cannot look the South Asia as a isolated region. We have to take into account South Asia as a link with the rest of the world. That is the first point. So that's why the security observers, what they have been questioning, here we find the debate. Internationally they say military security is giving way to the human security of these kind of the discourses we are hearing in the developed world. But at the same time, we find that there is a very much focus on the military build-ups. If you see the states or nations' defense budgets, you would find the trend is very much on a positive trajectory. But this trend you find in South Asia more like a rushing or something that they think that for them, security conceptualization still is within the traditional conceptualization of the security. Within South Asia, still we feel that military security is imperative. Once you have a military security, then you have the other kinds of security. So within this mixture of what we call a traditional and non-traditional conceptualization of the security, you'll find that this Copenhagen School of Thoughts philosophy is lacking its constituency, either in India and at the same time in Pakistan. Or more, you can find it other these kinds of things. That also creates us another kind of a thing. We can, when I said this, you cannot look the South Asia as in an isolation. See three things happening at the moment. Russian society policies since 2014, they have started in the Europe, annex of the Crimea, and then they started looking towards the our part of the world and developing some kind of a link. You will find the Chinese assertive policy in the South China Sea and realizing that the United States, you can say once again, its policy of reassurances to its allies within that region. And that leads towards a new kind of a strategic competition between the Chinese and the Indians in the Indian Ocean. So that is the way we in Pakistan look at this competition as a phony kind of a rivalry because their trade volume is very high, their CBMs are working, but similar kind of things, when you look from here, you find that this is a real strategic competition and the United, it is the advantage of the United States. So building India, checking China, it is in their global agenda. 
So by this way we can find it. Of course that creates some kind of paradoxes as security paradoxes and strategic competitions. So in this context when we are looking there is another important thing that within our region two kinds of the developments are taking place. One is what you call it ABM systems. India is investing a lot. Pakistan is taking into account seriously and reacting to that. So there is an action reaction syndrome I came back later on. It. So that's why when I, what is my remaining focus of the today's talk is I try to answer these four questions and then in the question answer there will be more deliberation of similar issues. For instance, what are the constructs of the strategic environment in South Asia? What are the constituents of delicate balance of terror in South Asia? Where the balance of terror situation sustain prevalent status quo in future and prevent war between India and Pakistan, especially after the maturity of India's gold star doctrine, proactive military operation strategy, and similarly Pakistan's battlefield nuclear weapons potential. So similarly, final question is what are the prospects for strategic stability? In this context, when we are looking about these kind of things, of course, we find it that in the second nuclear age, we, the, where there is a lot of focus on the centrality of the nuclear weapons, there is also some kind of a conceptualization there. It's very interesting. When we try to conceptualize the balance of terror, we say lose-lose affair challenges the Clausewitzian concept of war as an instrument of politics. This is number one. But in case of South Asia, neither India nor Pakistan are fully convinced with that. That is the first point. Second, nuclear weapons lethality sustained deterrence as dominant concept of a nuclear strategy since the beginning of nuclear age in the military doctrines of nuclear weapon state. But can this uh, sustain when we say deterrence stability? It means then both the rival or strategic competitors should avoid provocation. But in the context of India and Pakistan, if you see, Pakistanis say that Indians are provoking. If you see from 2014 13 till December 2015, fire at the line of control, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's approach towards India, he visited India, and then on the other side, uh, you, uh, tensions, India's own assertion that there happened like Patan Court and these kind of things. So you cannot hear like either side or neither I am in a position to defend one side. So you will find a counter argument on there. So the lethality of the weapons has not worried any. So only this lethality of the nuclear weapon has, or this balance of terror has, lowered down the scale. So there was time that India started looking for the limited war options, Pakistan started looking for the non, further non-conventional kind of the option, and now India is also looking for similar kind of the option. Their defense minister and the other said that we have to use it and recently unearthed these intelligence war has been gone. In this context, of course, we know the deterrence is neither synonymous, deterrence based on, I mean, balance of terror is neither synonymous to strategy nor conflict resolution. So there is a gray area. And that gray area is very much critical, which we have to take into account. So that's why I say the three things which are essential in the South Asia because of, uh, for the peace due to this balance of terror, there seems missing. For example, there is not a realization, prevention of preventive war. If we can see India's, uh, you can see military buildup, it gives you the impression that they may go for a preventive war. If you ask the Indians or to review the Indian literature, you would find it that similar kind of a argument you find there is existing that Pakistan is building military capability. The moment it gets some advantage, it may go for it, what you call it uh, military adventure. So that means on both sides in the literature you find a competing argument. Similar second is the development of survivable second strike capability. Indeed, they both are working on that. And the third is awareness of nuclear war or these kind of things. So in this case, when we are trying to see what we find it, that problem is some kind of a, all kind of asymmetries existing. For example, 
if you focus on India and Pakistan, the first estimate we made is that by every significant measure of power, military spending, men under arms, population, economic strength, control of territory, India enjoys massive advantages over Pakistan. Even in a, on a diplomatic, you can say, in a chessboard, it has a more or bigger advantage today. Pakistan has been endeavoring to sustain this kind of a situation for, a deter for its deterrence capability or credibility, but there are certain real obstructions like economic obstruction, diplomatic obstruction. And in this context, if you see that we had three major crises, Kargil, 2001-2002 military deployments, 2008 bombing. In all these three crises, the United States role was very significant as a third party. But I have a doubt that in the future, if there is a similar kind of crisis, whether India is going to listen to the United States or whether Pakistanis are going to trust on the United States mediation. So because of this, after Salala between the United States and Pakistan's relations, there is also there are certain ways. So this is the very important thing. So when I say, as I said earlier, that it, my second question was that what are the constructs of the South Asian strategic environment? I can just flash nine constructs and which are very much deterministic. On the one side, they create balance of terror, but at the same time, they generate a real fear or they are real terrorizing constructs. Number one, you see they're both actors in South Asia, major actors. We cannot look the other smaller states in this context. They are nuclear capable and also a strategic competitor. Second, India's great power ambitions and it's the way it's tried to present its rivalry with China. This rivalry is perceived differently in Pakistan. Third, India's core star doctrine or proactive military operation strategy or whatever you give it name, it is generating or leading me to the fourth upsurge in India's both offensive and defensive missile program. India's mega investment in the conventional weaponry, which is obviously widening the gap or a symmetry between Pakistan. Whereas on the other side, this war on terrorism, if you see in the last 14 years, 15 years, it has, uh, it has undermined Pakistan's economic growth and limits its investment in the defense sector. It's another thing that the, some strategists I heard uh, recently in the United States, they are saying, oh, because of the war on terrorism, Pakistani armed forces are battle-hardened forces and they may be more adventurous. But on the other side, the argument is that after, because of this war on terrorism, they are in a battle fatigue as well. So by this way, Pakistan's limitations have been very much there due to this. Pakistan is lagging behind in expensive arms race. India and Pakistan nuclear weapons programs are on an expansionary or what you call it developmental trajectory. That is a very much change. Both sides testing. Recently India tested. Before that Pakistan conducted a test of its, uh, you can say, missiles. Similarly, they are working on. And above all, which is most important missing, because if, as I said earlier, that the balance of terror was institutionalized, institutionalized and brought a stability after the ABM Treaty, and ABM Treaty was an arms control arrangement. As such an arms control arrangement is missing in the South Asia. We are not uh, even visualizing, you can say, thinking that there could be an arms control arrangement in the near future. Yes, there are two very important CBMs like non-attack on each other's nuclear installation, or uh, you can prior notification or missile test but you cannot find that they have further moved. They are just a CBM. So in this way, if you see it, that uh, there's on a strategic chessboard, both sides have a, there's an asymmetry. India is modernizing conventionally. Pakistan is facing constraint. But in the nuclear realm, Pakistan is also modernizing and India is also modernizing. So if we try to see these kind of things, it leads to us Another kind of a puzzle, and this puzzle is unavoidable. For example, if you see that balance of terror, which has on the basis of which nuclear deterrence theory was theorized in the East West or during the first nuclear age, that nuclear deterrence theory confronts a situation in South Asia that is very different from the context in which such theorization develops, namely the United States Soviet Union confrontation during the Cold War. What are the differences? I have identified seven major differences. 
Number one, common border. In South Asia, you have a common border. There, there was not a common border. Second, short measure flight time, limiting reaction time to almost nothing. I was yesterday discussing this issue with the, with the director of this institute, and there, he very rightly pointed out, like there was an incident, if you recall, when Norway conducted a test of its uh, rocket and Russians became panicked, but it was the 90s, mid 90s. Think similar kind of things, one could happen, second happened, so we don't have a reaction time, that is very dangerous. Whereas in the case of India, uh, Americans and Russians experienced, there was a 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes flight time. Third, remembrance of who was an unlimited border skepticism. If you see in the history of the Cold War, when you try to learn from the historical First and Second World War, both states were allies. And in our case, in the South Asian case, both states from the very beginning, 1947, they received independence, and from that day they are fighting. This is a very psychologically, a very different situation. And the fourth is, of course, premier Kashmir dispute. Every day there is a you can say fighting on. And Kashmir dispute is very interesting. Some people say it's a border. It's a border with a full of blood and flesh. Human beings are there. Whereas if you look the China and India's border, it's in Amalia, that is not like that. That's why that conflict is not maturing. Or they are able to work uh, positively on the CBS like of the 1996 CBS to cut down the forces and mutual build up. Understand it, I mean. Then, fifth is the most important, and that is active involvement in each other's intrastate conflicts. For instance, if I, I mean, recently Pakistan gave a dossiers to the United Nations, submitted dossiers in which they said in Balochistan, federal and state of tribal area, and Karachi, Indian law is involved. On the other side, if you see Indians have established, and it's an established fact that when they try to, I'm not saying that whether it's correct or incorrect, but it's a fact. They say in 2008, in Mumbai, 2001, 2002, an attack on Indian parliament in 1999, the military, you can say, all these activities were sponsored for Pakistan. So it means that both sides, to some extent, they are trying to exploit the intrastate conflict within both states for their particular advantages. And that is a very much spoiling for editorial stability. Contesting F6 is contesting regional and global outlook. When I say regional and global outlook, if you see, as uh, we have seen, and interestingly, within the region, they also exploit our differences. For example, Iranians, Saudis, we had a good relations, we didn't support them on Yemen, they invited Modi. When uh, we were not, we were nearer to the Saudis, Iran had a defense pact with India. So this kind of activity, but at the same time, we have a different look. We are making a China-Pakistan economic corridor. We are looking at it as an economic beneficiary, whereas for India, that is the destabilizing. India build up whatever the reason in the Indian Ocean, we think, oh, it's a challenge for us. So that kind of thing. And as I already mentioned, power is symmetry. So in this case, what we are trying to look about is that these capabilities or powers have created similar kind of a situation which we use is stability, instability, or vulnerability, or invulnerability problems. For example, nuclear deterrence is meant for non-action that sustains status quo, threatening these people. But in our case, this nuclear deterrence, based, based on balance of terror, is not meant for non-action. When I say non-action, then we should avoid to provoke each other. But here, as I mentioned in the construct or destabilizing puzzles, if you recall, you will find that we are not believing in a state. This means both states having nuclear weapons, their policies or activities reflect that they are revealing a state. So this is the first point, a very important point. Similarly, in the case of India and Pakistan's strategic relations, nuclear weapons have been used not only for deterrence purposes, but more than that, thereby stability and stability paradox was instituted as an integral component of South Asian strategic vocabulary. In vulnerability, vulnerability, dispersed deployment, these are also important points there. So if you try to see the current trends in the South Asia, I mean in 2016, they are again alarming. Number one current trend is vertical proliferation, both strategic and tactical nuclear weapons. 
If you see that in the here in the press, Western press, it is regularly they publish that Pakistan's fastest growing nuclear weapons program. But when you focus on the Cyprian book, it's very interesting. I was doing research, research I noticed that ev since 1998 to date, every year Cypri guys make a calculation. They had 10 weapons in Pakistani bracket and 10 in the Indians. So it means that both states are improving, not improving, but adding new weapons. And they are going for a new. So that's why you find it an arms race between India and Pakistan, like technical nuclear weapons are there, cruise missiles are there, ballistic missile defense system, India is investing in that sector, sea-based weapons are coming, purchase of sophisticated weaponry from other nations is there. Pakistan, as I said, and I portrayed a very weak economy, but recently 8 f 16 Pakistan agreed, or you can say is going to purchase from uh, United States, India is purchasing Rafael from France, Pakistan is going for, going to change, uh, change uh, you can say, revamp its uh, uh, aircraft by replacing, adding 200 in the near future. So these are the things which you cannot. But the most pessimistic is, again I can say that there is the absence of arms race in this kind of things. So that leads us to a three major caveats. What are those three major caveats? Number one, that the technical level of at the technical level of strategy, both India and Pakistan strategies indicate that both strategies, military doctrines, both states' military doctrines are in a state of transition. When the military doctrines are in a state of transition, that means that both are not satisfied with the current situation. And where from that satisfaction come? Naturally, that whatever the policies they adopt, they would be leading towards a crisis. So if I'm satisfied with this balance of terror, then I should not go far further. Second, the conventional and nuclear weapons modernization alarms about the probability of strategic instability. Second, and of course, arms race contains inherent potential to destabilize the deterrent stability. In this context, of course, if you see that Pakistanis use this word, but in the America, they, they have a different cold start doctrine. So in Pakistan, whether you say that is it, it, they have a history of the core star doctrine, but recently the Indians start using the word proactive military operation strategy. But the basic idea or philosophy of these two is that India is preparing for a speeder mobilization to match Pakistan Army's mobilization to launch multiple thrusts across the border in the event of war. Cross the border into Pakistan within 48 to 96 hours. Maintain tempo or blitzkrieg which continues pouring of offensive force forces in a non-linear battlefield like heliborne and para dropping to reach depths between 30 km to 60 km. Take earliest advantage of political nod for war before it change its mind. Maintain operational surprise. Primary aim is destruction of Pakistan Army's offensive force forces in a series of attrition battles. These are the view of Pakistani you can say strategic community about India's core star doctrine or proactive military operations strategy. So naturally they they came up with the with this proactive strategy. So the conclusions in Pakistan are that the strategy is to find, fix, fight and finish military targets to sustainably to substantially degrade Pakistan Army's offensive capability by fast moving operations in a non linear battlefield. The emphasis on three aspects degradation by massive firepower, both air power and ground, you can say base artillery, fast, second is movement suggesting maneuver, and third, employ non linearity meaning. So naturally that leads to Pakistan to go for a, you can say, countermeasures. For example, India's counter, in this context, first objective, they say military objective is confuse, paralyze, knockout, Pakistan. So when it comes knockout, they start multiplying their capability. In multiplying capability, of course, Pakistan defense budget is not enough to match arm by arm or some kind of a parity, so they went for a tactical or this kind of investment. On the side of diplomatic, credible, coercive diplomatic ability, which India wants to acquire or compel us capability they want to acquire. So on this side, when the Pakistanis start looking or talking about highlighting the tactical weapon, Naturally, that is a maybe a balancing and political in the sub kind of the things. 
So in this context, we can say that this balance of terror has leads us to five different level of a strategy. Number one, a technical level transforming India's 21st, uh, 20th century half fisted outlook into Maldives armed forces and at the same time Pakistan is also moving on a similar line. If you read Pakistan's as may know exercise or these kind of things you find there. So of course both sides are working to minimize the climate time but that is a dangerous for the uh, you can say things. Such a situation what kind of the point is in the case of India it seems that they think that they can commence crisis and they go for a crisis stability. In the case of Pakistan, they say that if you can commence a crisis, but you cannot ensure the crisis stability. So if that means that if there is no crisis stability, then there is no strategic stability. And as I already pointed out, that the arms race is itself is contributing in a negativity. So by this way, when we try to see all these kinds of the things, we find that there are certain kinds of the countermeasures by Pakistan, but those countermeasures, strategically speaking, or as student of strategic study, they are viewed as a destabilizer. So those countermeasures are basically to sustain the balance of terror for the sake of strategic stability, but in reality they alarm us because of the number of the things like which are co what you can say byproduct of. For example, Pakistan is gradually maturing its nuclear trial and adding tactical nuclear weapons in its nuclear arsenal. Pakistan's National Command Authority announced full spectrum deterrence. And full spectrum deterrence, but you say at the same time they use the word minimum credible full spectrum, so no unending. So situationally it is upgrading. And it also manifests posture of capability, both counter force and counter value target. So by this way, when we try to see Pakistanis are trying to synergize, I can use the word synergization of the conventional and nuclear capability to check the India's conventional might as well. So this is the difference that when you start looking that they are not making a distinction that if there is a conventional attack or a limited war or a cold start, are they going to simply check it with a conventional, no they are saying tactical, first use, last use, all these types of the things you find it and that generates a lot of confusion in the strategic environment. So that, that's why when we try to look about the Pakistan's uh, what we call it full spectrum return, of course, within Pakistan, we find certain debates, but I can say here before concluding that thinking unthinking have, uh, thinkable is happening in Pakistan. For example, emerging power equation between India and Pakistan forced Pakistan to think unthinkable while chopping out its war fighting strategy with India. For example, can Islamabad quash four traditional guiding concepts of chopping out nuclear strategy from its nuclear lexicon. What are the four traditional guiding principles? Number one, Bernard Brody conceptualization of the nuclear strategy. That you make a nuclear strategy to fight a war but actually to avoid a war. So here both states are making a nuclear strategy but at the same time they have a limited war concept, they have a non-conventional war concept. So it means that they are deviating from that principle. Second is Hamil Khan's escalatory ladder concept. But when you say escalatory ladder concept, that if you introduce on the one side they are coming with the proactive military operation strategy within, well, I mean 36 to 92 hours or 72 hours, they wanted to capture a territory, hold a first bite and hold a territory. Whether Pakistanis are going to decide that they can first face a knockout or they can go for a tactic. It is still unclear. So this escalatory ladder is not a guiding principle. The third is, Nuclear weapon is a last resort weapon. If you have a strategic weapons on the both sides, then you say it's a last resort weapon. But if they have a tactical weapons on the both sides, then again, it's too difficult for me to assume or accept that nuclear weapons are a last resort weapon. And finally, of course, what is your nuclear threshold? Nobody knows. If say, we say, oh, our red lines are this, this, and here I was uh, just a, uh, I have to, for example, Robert Jervis said that uh, when the military, anything military forces are set in motion, there is a danger that things will get out of control. The working of machines and reaction of humans in times of stress cannot be predicted with high confidence. So red lines or these nuclear thresholds, what we are saying today, nobody can predict and 
I have no confidence in it. So that leads me towards my final point because there are five minutes left. A, on the Pakistani side, one cannot ignore some kind of a nuclear weapons puzzle. What is the puzzle? Deployment close to border, its own troops vulnerability. That of course, as I said earlier, the vulnerability, vulnerability kind of thing. Command and control complications, field security, preemptive pressures, use it or lose it dilemma, development of small heat nuclear weapons and likely transformation to the armed forces would lower the nuclear threshold and increase the chances of accidental inadvertent use. So by this way when we try to see in the South Asian strategic environment, I have identified five, six kind of a problems uh, for and that is my concluding part. The first is the action action syndrome intensifies security dilemma puzzle of both India and Pakistan. And it is everyday multiplied. The security dilemma not only sustains arms race between the belligerent neighbors but also germinates destabilizing miscalculation and misperception. The miscalculation and misperceptions are always prone to war. Second, deployment and delegation has inbuilt destabilizing variables. As the warheads are made to deliver system, and these systems get deployed, issues of accidental, inadvertent, unexercised launch stemming from pre-delegation of authority would begin to surface. Third, a defensive buildup creates pressure for offensive countermeasures. If they can go for BMD, of course, the prior BMD, folk, uh, you can say compel the or oblige the other side to go for increasing its nuclear capability, I mean more nuclear delivery system or nuclear weapon. So the, at the same time, tension between India and Pakistan could be further increased, leading to destabilizing of strategic stability in South Asia. Four, the calculus of rail politics holds that India behind the safe missile shield might be more likely to adopt military adventurous policies against Pakistan. And that leads towards where Pakistanis express or they are more worried about India's Cold Star doctrine or military operations strategy coupled with the missile defense system capability. Pakistanis are looking that at least this aero missile, which is a Patriot Pack 2, which is in, in the Indian arsenal, that would be creating a lot of UFS UN drive. By this way, when we try to look in the fifth, such a strategic environment compels Pakistan to develop more robust deterrents which would be likely response but leading to an increase in the number of nuclear delivery system and fissile material which is again though on the one side it create a balance of terror for India but it also create a balance of terror for the rest of the region. Finally a strong Islamabad nuclear response to changes in its strategic balance with New Delhi would inevitably raise the strategic temperature between India and Pakistan, something that would have an adverse impact on the nuclear deterrence stability or a region a strategic stability in the region. So in this context, my final word in this is that the Indian Pakistani military buildup would Indian Pakistani military buildup would create an enormous spiral in offensive defensive arm race, entailing a strategic environment which is immensely complex volatile and unpredictable. Thank you very much.